Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with the town of La Paz, Mayor Andre Murphy. Known as the Gateway to the North, La Paz is a multi industry northern Manitoba town serving the surrounding region. The main components of the region's economy are agriculture, forestry, commercial fishing, tourism, transportation, and services, especially health and education. Now, the main employer is the paper mill operated by Canadian Craft Papers. The PAW contains one of the two main campuses of the University College of the North. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Andre Murphy. Are you looking for a team of experienced professionals to help develop a strategic plan for your municipality? Look no further. At Strategic Steps, their team of experts has years of experience working in municipal administration. They take a comprehensive approach to planning, carefully listening to your community's needs, and working closely with your council to develop a homegrown strategy tailored to your unique community. Contact Strategic Steps today to learn more about how they can help you create a brighter future for your community. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Andre? Uh, I don't know if it was a, a real sense of duty. I, I think that uh, uh, I, when I retired from my uh, from my career, I... I seen the opportunity that uh, the mayor's position was open, and I really felt that I could make a difference and or try to make a difference with, within our community around, you know, creating partnership and being more engaging, more visible, uh, more accountable to people. You know, I, I see you know we have a lot of great people in this community, and we have a great community, and there's a there's huge opportunities to to get uh, to move things forward. So, yeah, I mean, I've always been a volunteer, you know, I've always done, I was involved with uh, minor sports, still involved for many, many years with hockey, it's sort of my uh, my dream job of uh, coaching youth hockey, um, you know, and I was involved with uh, other things within Trappers Festival in town and the Chamber of Commerce and, and, and those type of things. So... Manitoba has the worst history of keeping election results on any website I can find. The oh, only okay. election that I can find from uh, for you is 2018 and 2022. Are those the first two elections that you run in or did you run prior no. to 2018? No, those are the only two elections I ran in. Okay, so in 2018, you ran for councillor. In 2022, you were ran for mayor, correct? Right, right. Okay. So I've got to ask the question, this uh, sort of stupid, uh, obvious question, but what was it about the municipal realm that finally made you say, okay, this is where I want to give back? Because you could have given back through provincial politics, federal politics, but you chose the municipal route. What was that decision based on, Andre? Well, I guess, you know, if I think about that, and I've never really thought about <laughs> whether I could go at different levels, but... When I think about the municipal politics, I, I believe that you have a bigger chance of making a bigger impact on the community that you're in. Um, and at the same time, I think you can also be held more accountable for what you're doing, uh, which I believe it's important for us as elected officials to be held accountable. Um, so yeah, I, I guess if I was going to decide, I think you can kind of get lost in the provincial politics world and maybe not have a uh, as a big of an impact on your own community as you would as a in municipal politics you, you it's you're right you do make a massive impact at the local level particularly around that council table because when you make a decision at that council table it impacts the community the day after or a few days after provincial it could be a few months federal 
Heck, it could be a year. Who knows? But municipal, it could be a few days. How do you ensure that the decisions you're making around that council table are making the biggest impact, but not in a negative way, biggest impact that is going to help the community succeed, whether they voted for you or they didn't vote for you? Well, I think we have a great council, and that's one of the things that's important. There's a cross-section of people that were elected uh, to represent uh, the community or the members of our community. And so we all bring different sort of uh, aspects to the table. And, uh, you know, we all have one vote. Being the mayor doesn't mean that I have any more uh, power than uh, the councillors that's sitting beside me. So I think having that uh, diversity within the council group uh, helps us make those decisions. And I also think, uh, I believe that, you know, when we make those decisions, um, I hope that uh, community members, you know, we try to communicate as best as possible after every meeting by going on the radio and and we meet with the newspaper and and we're also all of our councillors are out in the in the, on the streets, you know, in the real world, uh, and, and we want uh, our citizens to say, hey, I don't like this or I or I think this was a great idea, but we also need to be talking about the decisions that we're making as well. Um, I guess when I when I look at things is that you know we have to look at it as a, for ourselves as well when when you know we, if we're making a decision you know does it really make sense would you do that if that was your money uh those type of thing and and would you is it make sense overall to to is it going to make is there bringing value I guess to the community like is it and value may not just be based on a return on investment on dollars wise but you know, is it improving the life of our citizens uh, overall and in general? I'm not a huge social media commenter. Uh, I, I like to put out positive news uh, on social media and on my account. I don't typically like uh, getting into a debate online over an issue. And, you know, it's always uh, usually will typical, typically message somebody and say, just call me and I'll give you the ideas or give you the rationale behind council's decision are people in the paw willing to do that because when i speak to municipal leaders across canada i get a sense that there's an apathy when it comes to municipal politics and i say that with respect because some municipalities don't there's actually engagement in their community but in the paw when you ask people for their opinion and actually go out to the community and not do it via social media because i agree with you social media can sometimes be just a very interesting and i'll use that word loosely place to put your thoughts do people give you their honest feedback on the way that the town is moving forward or the way that the town has voted on something or do you have to sort of engage with them at a sort of granule level level at the grocery store or even at the coffee shop you know and i think that's important for us to to engage with them at that level because that's where people are more comfortable uh so yeah i i, I don't think surveys are are something that's going to get you information. You know, I don't think uh, putting a message on social media and saying, what do you think uh, without, so we, I, I believe us as a council where we, you know, we believe being out there and discussing and talking to community members all the time, uh, you know, trying to encourage people to come to our meetings, um, those type of things. But I also believe that when you see something or you hear something, that's uh, uh that may not have the right information is to go directly to the people and 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 explain to them whether they like the message or not um uh, because you know you got to remember like you mentioned earlier chris i mean we're doing this for an overall um reason not not for a, an individual or a, a small group of people it's it's sort of the doing it for the good of all sort of thing um so yeah i i don't know I don't know if an if a survey is an engagement uh, tool that's very useful in in municipalities, but uh, talking in the grocery stores and in the corner stores and on the coffee shops is important, and as well as you know making sure that you're talking to sometimes the right people as well because there's some people that are very vocal about our community and and uh, it's important to keep those people engaged as well because they can also get the message out. 
I, I'm assuming after your time in office so far, you've come to the realization that you're not pleasing 100% of the people in your community oh, with every yeah. decision. <laughs> Don't yeah. even have to answer, finish that question. How important, though, is it for yourself to engage with the people who disagree with you? Because um, we often hear that we should listen to every side of an issue, whether it be good or bad. How important is it for you to, when you make that decision, to listen to the people who don't just agree with you, but who say, Andre, what did you do that decision for? Because now it's going to impact me. Is it important for you to listen to both sides? No, oh, absolutely. It's important. It's it's just as important as the, it's easy to listen to the positive message. It's a little bit more difficult to listen to the, to the people or to somebody that's uh, concerned about what decisions are being made. Uh, but I also believe it's up to us to be, uh, as municipal leaders, to be out there and be able to listen and take that feedback. Uh, because did we miss something? Uh, but more importantly, it's to try to explain the rationale on why the decision was made. Um, not that you're trying to convince somebody to do that it's any different, but make sure they understand why that decision has been made. And I, and I believe that's one of the, the gaps that happens in municipal politics or in a lot of politics is decisions are made and people don't really understand the reasons why uh, they're being made or why something's not happening. And so when you see that and you hear that, um, you really should address it. And, uh, and with, with, the, with the really the intent to providing information, not to convince them that it's that, but provide them all the facts so that they understand why things are done the way they're done. And examples are like that, you know, uh, you know, it's it's like, hey, uh, we've got uh, uh, an issue going on within our downtown community with public safety. Um, you know, how come we don't have, you know, police officers all walking around downtown and and. There might be other things that are going on within the community that we don't know about, and uh, but we, you know, we're addressing those issues by other methods or other means, um, you know, or 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 financial decisions. We're going to talk about some of the issues that the PAW is going through right now in a few minutes. But before I do that, I want to talk. I want to jump back to something you just said in that last statement, and you said. Did we miss something? And that is a key thing I want to just ask about here for a second, because you get an agenda package every week at a council meeting happens and you review that council meeting agenda package and try to make the best informed decision prior to going into that council meeting. But you have to keep an open mind because there may be something that someone says in that council meeting or a resident comes in and gives a delegation that may sway your mind. How important is it to keep an open mind, knowing that we all have unconscious biases around certain issues, but as a municipal leader, you have to hear all sides prior to making that informed decision, so that way you don't come to the conclusion that, oh, did we miss something? Yeah, and, and, and you're right. I mean, our our role is, is to make the best decision with the information that's in front of us. And so it's also our role to listen to see if we did miss anything and uh, and have have this. That's why we have a cross section of people on our council is that do they have other ideas or is there something that may have they know or are aware of that all of us weren't aware of? And <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, the decisions made with that information that's there. And if there's something that's been that's at it. Yeah, absolutely. We need to we need to make sure that uh, the right decision is being made. Are we going to make mistakes from time to time? Absolutely. Uh, but I can tell you, I'm uh, I'm somebody that likes to get things done, and I'm not going to wait around for a hundred percent solution for everything because uh, if we were going to do that, uh, nothing would ever get done. So you make the decision with the information you have available, and you get moving on it. And be prepared to, uh, you know, change courses or or you may have to hit the brakes every once in a while and say, whoops, wait a minute, is this the right direction? Uh, before we turn to the issues, I have one last question in this sort of same range here. I have noticed that there has been a blurring of jurisdictional lines within the municipal realm. You as the mayor, as council, understand that you as the municipality have your role to play in the day-to-day -day lives of everyone. You deal with certain issues that the municipality can only deal with. 
But I would say that there is a misunderstanding from the general public, and I'm painting a very broad stroke, not just in Nepal, but across the entire country of Canada, that people don't understand where the municipality's role is compared to where the provincial role is or where the federal government role is. In your time as mayor, have you noticed more and more people asking you questions or asking you to address issues that are in the provincial or federal jurisdiction, whether it be healthcare, whether it be education, whether it be, and I say this because it's just the top of the mind right now, foreign affairs because everything going on in the world right now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I haven't had too much conversation around foreign affairs uh, on that front of it, but uh, absolutely, on the healthcare front, on the public safety, RCMP, uh, you know, those type of uh, uh, items are, are always there. I believe that today, you know, over the last number of years, we've been involved in recruitment of of, uh, of doctors and healthcare professionals. Um, you know, we're continually advocating for hospitals and and clinics and stuff and and getting trying to get healthcare services closer to our residents so they don't have to uh, travel six or seven hours to uh, go to a half an hour medical appointment. So yeah, I do see that uh, there's a lot more discussions on that. Uh, we have a lot more meetings with uh, community members, especially our seniors on, on you know the lack of healthcare or the concerns around healthcare. How do you tell someone it's not your jurisdictional role without telling them that it's not your jurisdictional role? Because you are the closest to them. You don't go to Winnipeg to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. They will probably be more likely to know who you are at the grocery store than their MLA or their MP. While you can call, you you don't want to feel like you're brushing off people in your community. So how do you tell people or do you just take the information that's provided and then go call your MLA and call your MP and say, this is what I'm hearing from the residents. Let's, we need to try to address it. How do you deal with issues that are outside your jurisdictional purview to ensure that the issues are being addressed from your citizens? Yeah. And I mean, that is a good, uh, a good point is that I, I, I personally, my, my, uh, I don't know if it's the right way of doing it, Chris, but this is the way I do it. Anyways, uh, I will listen to our, our res residents um, and and try to transfer some of that information both ways, uh, both from what I'm hearing at the provincial level, as well as uh, as me sharing information from our communities to the provincial or federal levels. I do believe it's my role, and and I could be incorrect, but it is my role to sort of represent my uh, community members and to be an advocate for them as well. Uh, but I also will share uh, sort of some of the actions or some of the things that they can do to also um, advocate for themselves. So, you know, it's it's like like when you have a senior approach you at 92 years old, concerned that she doesn't have a family doctor. Uh, when I get an opportunity to talk to the health minister, uh, I will share that information and about the concerns within my community. Because not only, you know, we're concerned about the individual citizen there, but when you think about the just the general, uh, uh, you know, pillars of a community, healthcare is one, and and I don't want our seniors having to move out of our community to live in a different community so that they can have a family doctor or are closer to healthcare. Um, that doesn't create a very good business model for a community. That's for sure. No, and I appreciate that, and I agree 100% that the role of the mayor is to advocate at all levels, and it's outside the jurisdictional role of the mayor, you have to advocate for the issues that your residents are, so I give you props for that. I want to turn to the city, the town as a whole now, and I want to ask yeah. the question, but before I do, I'm going to preface it as I always do on the show, because I want to make sure people understand that this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. For those who are about to send me their emails, because I often get emails from this question, I will file it in the appropriate location. Mayor, in your opinion, as of recording this episode on April 3rd, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of the Paw today? Uh, hmm. I believe there's a couple of issues. Growth, which sort of 
comes to the cost of residents, cost impact on residents in our community and uh, the whole aspect of crime. Uh, and when I say crime, I'm talking about the addictions, homelessness sort of issue. And uh, my third thing, I guess, would be around healthcare. Um, you know, we have the oldest hospital in the province. Uh, we don't have an actual clinic, a really good functional clinic. Um, and we have hear from healthcare professionals that um, you build it and we'll come uh, uh, through our recruitment. So on the growth front, uh, Chris, what I would say is that we struggle uh, with our tax uh, assessment uh, within our community to maybe engage investors as much as we would like to. Um, I believe that our community is working very hard to sort of diversify what uh, we are as a community. Um, and, but it's, it's, you know, it's going to take more partnerships. One of the things that, uh, when it comes to the cost of the residents, you know, we talk about, uh, our fastest growing cost in our community is RCMP costs. Um, it's a cost that we don't control. Uh, we have no impact on it. Uh, it's a pass through cost. And, uh, and, um, you know, when we get an invoice for, you know, three and a half plus the $3.6 million annually uh, for a residence of, we're a, a community of 5,000, uh, it's hard to swallow. Um, so, you know, I know that AMM and FCM are, are advocating on a different cost model, but we are, are surrounded by communities that pay a million dollars a year. Um, in, in, and, and I guess we, we struggle a little bit with that um, on the crime front sort of goes, sort of ties into a bit of the healthcare front. I mean, we are a regional hub of, for, uh, uh communities that come in or, uh, well, just before I get away from growth, uh, the other, you know, I think when we talk about diversifying our area, um, we are, we are pretty lucky as we are actually three communities in one, uh, with the RM of Kelsey and the Opasqua Cree Nation and, uh, and the, um, and as well as the um, RM of Kelsey. Um, but we have the Western Corridor that's been discussed about uh, opening up um, the road that comes from Saskatchewan uh, and through Alberta on Highway 283 and Highway 5 that actually la ends up right in our area here, the tri-community. And our, we are also at uh, point zero of the Port of Churchill rail line so when you think about uh, the opportunities and the potential there on the growth, I really can see uh, a future where our, our focus has moved away from, you know, we have a very large uh, pulp and paper or, or paper industry in town, uh, but I could see our, our, uh, the diversity of our businesses moving away from maybe just, instead of just forestry and, uh, and healthcare to maybe adding a shipping hub type of arrangement. Uh, I always say it's the northern center port. So uh, do we do we end up with uh, uh, some sort of vision or picture there? So we we need to be ready for that and make sure that we have the businesses in place and the structure in place. <clears throat> we have the willingness for sure within our community. I believe we have the drive of wanting to make sure it happens. Um, I'm just not sure on, uh, and this is something that we're working on with our, with all of our partners as making sure that we have the, the investment ready to, to do it. We have the land and all that sort of stuff. Um, okay. So now, I want to, I want to play in the sandbox for a few minutes, if you don't mind, because I think this is an important conversation. Growth is being a, an issue I'm hearing a lot from a lot of municipal mayors from Manitoba. The growth issue uh, is a challenge for them. Now, and I, I say this and I did not prepare you for this, but we are recording this a day after the provincial budget just got tabled in the province of Manitoba. 
investment. There is an increase to investment for municipalities to address some of the growth challenges that they're having. Uh, there was a freeze under the last government. This government has lifted that freeze and sort of done sort of a increase, whether it be small. And I only know it's small because I just spoke to Cam Blight, the president of AMM, the Reeve of the RM of uh, Port of Zabari. But in your mind, do you think this government is addressing your concerns that you've just mentioned in that last two minute speech that you just gave? Well, um, I'm, I'm going to try to be uh, as straight <laughs> as possible. I don't, I looked, I watched the uh, presentation yesterday uh, by Minister Sala. Uh, I read the backgrounder. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure it has um, addressed what we need. Uh, but again, I, do want to give a bit of a I, I do want to give a bit of time to be able to uh, speak to the provincial level because you know obviously they're going to you know the backgrounder highlights a bunch of stuff and there may be things in there that I just don't see uh, clearly. Uh, well, let's talk again in six months and uh, I'm a pretty straightforward fella. Uh, I will let you know if I if I thought that it would be addressed. Um, I don't see. A couple of key uh, things being mentioned, uh, but it, again, it might be it might be buried in the details. So I do want to give a you know I appreciate the provincial government of uh, you know list, lifting the the uh, municipal uh, granting uh, fee uh, funds that were going forward. Um, there was a few other things for northern Manitoba, but I'm an advocate for northern Manitoba. It, it, we we are different than southern Manitoba. Uh, believe it or not, and uh, and I think that uh, we also have different needs and uh, uh, for uh, than Southern Manitoba. Um, like I mentioned, sort of goes into the healthcare discussion. You know, the, one of the pillars uh, of growth is is healthcare, and uh, and you need to have a, a, a strong healthcare system to keep people from not leaving your community. Um, at the same time, you know, we have. Uh, serious addictions, homelessness uh, issues with that's with this going on in our in our community, and uh, it's unfortunate that we don't have the back uh, support systems to to even uh, to even be able to remotely treat people. Uh, you know, we I have I I talk to people all the time, and and some of our our peers that are on the street, and you know the people that want help can't get help. Um, even when they say they want help, they can't get help. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm not a hundred percent sure how that's going to shake out. I know, uh, we've had a good presentation from, uh, from Frank uh, Turner with regards to a healing center within our, uh, area. And, you know, I didn't see that name directly, but is that there? Maybe it is. Uh, I, so appreciate, yeah, I, I appreciate your honesty there. And I apologize for putting you on the spot there. It's just, I just wanted to ask that question because I think it's an important question to ask. I want to go back to the growth issue for a second, if you don't mind, because sure. um, growth comes at a cost and you, you kind of talked about it a little bit in, in, in the, the original state, a question I asked, how do you balance the growth with the community? Because you're you're trying to do a lot for your community. It sounds like, and trying to get it on it on a stable footing to move forward, to continue to grow, to address the issues. But people are struggling right now. People are struggling financially right now, and you can't grow the community in a way that you are hoping to. I'm assuming, uh, without doing it by raising property taxes, because that is the only form of funding that municipalities can sort of dig into right now. How do you balance the growth of your community with the realities of the here and now? Well, again, I, I one thing we can't do, uh, Chris, within our community is raise property taxes without having great value coming back to the community and having. So I've always said you have to spend money to earn money. And if you get the right investment and you get the right partnership, um, sometimes a little bit of short-term pain uh, for long-term gain is is there. Uh, so when we are looking at any type of investment in our community, um, that's the you know we're not against trying to you know borrow money or 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 use the uh, use taxation to uh, create investment and generate revenue. 
but it has to be the right thing to one of the things that's a challenge is even within your own community and you're probably hearing it from others it's just maintaining the business you have today the infrastructure you have today you know when you have a when you know we did an asset management plan uh, a, a few years ago and our community is worth uh, 332 million dollars and you're trying to maintain all these uh assets and and roads and stuff uh you know just that alone um is is enough to uh, just to try to maintain what you have today is 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 a is a challenge um but what we have to do is we have to make sure that when we're looking at any type of investment and any uh, type of investors coming there, if there's if there's good value returning to our our community members, um, then you know taxation is one way of doing it. I also have a I'm a strong believer in creating partnerships uh, partnerships with investors, but you know we have uh, we are a tri community here, and and you know there's going to be time at time where it makes sense where our our three communities to come together and 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 do a you know a, a joint investment or a, a, a something joint along that lines. I, I appreciate that, and I'm cautious of time here. I just realized, and we're almost at the almost at the forty minute mark here. And I I haven't gotten to the question I want to get to, but but before I talk about my favorite subject, which is tourism. I want to ask the flip question to my original statement that started this line of questioning off. What does the PAW get right? What is the thing that when you go talk to other municipal leaders, when you talk to municipal, when you talk to your own residents, when you talk to neighbors, when you talk to investors, what do you talk about and what do you boast about, about why the PAW is doing what it's doing to get things right? Oh, that's a good question. Um, what do we get right? I would say, you know, one of the things that we have a very engaged community um, where if the right thing is there, we'll do it. I believe that when you look at our community, our volunteerism, um, you know, I, I believe that when we put on sort of any type of events, um, uh, there's always a lineup of people wanting to help out and, and celebrate whatever we've got going on. Um, I believe that, you know, we're a pretty diverse community, but I, I guess now I'm just, as I'm talking, thinking out loud here, I, I think what we get right is that we have, we're, we're, a, we have a very unique situation. We have three communities within one. Um, and, uh, and I guess what we get right is, you know, I think our, our, we're strengthening our bonds with uh, amongst our three communities uh, to make sure we're ready for what's going to come up, it, what is going to come in the future. But that's a, that's a good. Go ahead. I said, that's a good question uh, and something I'm going to have to think a little bit deeper about as well. Um, so I want to turn to my favorite subject, and that's tourism. Now, I have promised on this show that if you come on this show, I'm coming to your community. So I'm coming to the Paw later on this year. It actually might happen prior, prior to this episode airing because I've got a few days after the upcoming AMM conference that I'm going to have a few days to spend before I have to go to SUMA conference in Regina. So I might be coming in April. <laughs> that being yeah, said... Let's Let's do, it. Let's do it. What are what are some of the tourist destination spots that you talk to other municipal leaders or you recommend to tourists coming through uh, your area of Manitoba to the PAW to say, if you come, you have to stop and see this? Well, again, I, I'm going to say we are lucky to be, you know, we are lucky to be located to where we are. And and, and I didn't mention it at the beginning, but, uh, you know, we're on with our good friends at uh, uh, the Pasqua Cree Nation, we're on their traditional land, Treaty 5 territory. Uh, so, you know, we're very happy about that. But when I think about our area, you come to uh, our area, you have lakes, you have farming, you have mining, you have, uh, we have all sorts of trails. We have the longest, uh, longest uh, running winter festival, longer than the festival, the Voyageur. Uh, in at uh, the Northern Manitoba Trappers Festival, we have Opaskuak Indigenous Days in the summer. We have a uh, an Ag Day in the summertime. Uh, you know, uh, Opaskuak Indigenous Days is in in August, and we have 
Ag Days in June or end of June, early July. Uh, we have a great museum. Uh, we have a, a an area just outside of town called Round the Bed Farms where you can get all sorts of experience seeing buffalo. We have the Pasqua, Pasqua Trails. Uh, this this is, I don't even want to talk too much about it because we'll have so many people here next week there, Chris. We, we won't know what's going on. Well, which is perfect. That's what you want. You want the tourism money, the dollars to be spent in your community. <laughs> We're a state of an emergency. We'll have so many people in town. <laughs> where do oh, you go? Is... Go ahead. Where do I go? Well, I go out to the lake. Uh, my, my, I'm lucky. My son has a has a place out there, so I'll go out there and go. I spend lots of time at the uh, the Roy H. Johnson Arena and the Gordon Laughlin Memorial Center, uh, uh, watching youth hockey and watching uh, uh, junior hockey and and such like that. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, there's there's lots of things uh, there's lots of things to do in our community, uh, and that's one thing that we're very lucky. Like, if you're a fisherman, if you're a hunter, you're a snowmobile or a trapper, um, you know, there's tons of great things to see. I, I've introduced a new segment on this show, and it's it's advice. It's the advice segment on this show. Now, you have been mayor for roughly two years now, coming up to your second year uh, in November, or October, November, for, by the time this airs. What advice would you give a prospective candidate who is about to enter into the political arena, the municipal political arena, that you wish you would have known prior to entering into municipal politics? I would say one thing is, is things move at the pace they move at. <laughs> I'm a, I would love to see things move faster and quicker. And I find that just how it works as much as, and as frustrating as you can get, it moves as fast as it's going to move. Um, so I, I think we all come through the door uh, the very first time. And unfortunately, my first term in 2018, we spent a lot of time through COVID. So I, I took it as a as a really not a, a good experience. But when I when I think new counselors come on board, um, they hope to change the world overnight. And the unfortunate part is it doesn't just move at that speed. Um it's it's not like a private business where you can just do say something today and do something tomorrow it's there's there's a process that we have to follow and i and i at, at times i say that's good but at times i say that's not that good either um thank you for that um i want to end on my last question and it's the million dollar question we we started by talking about yourself we're ending by talking about the town as a whole in your opinion what makes the paw such a unique place to live to work and to raise a family I think our diversity of our community. I, I look at Opasqua Cree Nation, the RM of Kelsey, the town of the Paw. Uh, we have a culturally diverse community, um, and uh, it's just a it's a very very beautiful place to live. It's affordable, um, and uh, the people are awesome. Andre, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today. This has been fantastic. I, yeah, I, I never know how municipal leaders are going to react to my line of questionings, but it seems like we're good friends now, and now I can come up and spread the uh, the secret of the paw while I'm up there. But I appreciate this, and I thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of business schedule to do this interview. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for including me. I appreciate the opportunity. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all their diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews and the eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, helps amplify the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just Keep talking.